formalism was a literary movement and theory that um, acquired new consciousness in the 20th century. The roots of formalism were there in the works of Aristotle, in the works of the Romantics, in the works of the Symbolists, but it acquired a new consciousness, a new realization in the first half of the 20th century, especially in Russia. That is why it is called Russian formalism. So in this lecture, we are going to discuss Russian formalism. What is Russian formalism? Russian formalism emphasizes the formal aspect of art and literature. Previously, art and literature were studied from the historical, psychological, or autobiographical perspective. Art was an extension of history. Literature was an extension of philosophy. Metaphysical truths were the subject matter of the dramatists, of the poets, and of the romance writers. Moralization was the objective of various authors in different times and periods. Literature was not free. The formalist thinkers or theorists were the ones who emphasized the autonomy of literature. The autonomy of literature meant that literature was a separate domain, that literature was an independent, that the study of literature was an independent science, that literature was autotalic. Autotalic means that for, its, for the fulfillment of its purpose, for the fulfillment of its goals, literature doesn't go beyond itself. A work of art is a self-contained unit. A work of art is an autonomous unit. A work of art is free. A work of art is a whole, a complete whole. This was to be held by the formalists. The precursors of this school of formalism in Russia were um, Viktor Shklovsky, uh, Boris Eichenbaum, and um, Roman Jakobson. Other theorists and critics were also included in this school of thought. For example, Brooks is also included in this movement. Um, sometime Mikhail Bakhtin is also included in this school of thought. But the most prominent thinkers were Viktor Shklovsky, Boris Eichenbaum, and Roman Jakobsen. We're going to talk about these three critics, these three theorists, theorists in detail. Viktor Shklovsky was associated with the Society for the Study of Poetic Language established in 1916, and Roman Jakobsen was, was associated with the school named um, the Moscow Linguistic Circle. One thing is important. The formalists chose linguistics for their study. Instead of choosing history, anthropology, so sociology for, for their study, they chose linguistics. Because they thought that literature is a verbal art. Linguistics could encompass these verbal arts from the perspective of language. The study of language became important in the first half of the 20th century because new discoveries were made in linguistics. Previously, language was looked at as a naming system. And you are uh, familiar with Saussure's findings that language was an arbitrary system. For Saussure, language is not a naming system. Language creates a reality of its own. We are not going into the detail of Saussurean linguistics or structural linguistics, but these discoveries were of uh, much significance for formalist theorists. All of them had an excessive concern with the linguistic aspect of literature. That is why 
for them the um, the subject matter of the science of literature was not literature but literariness Literariness, in other words, meant what were the characteristics of literature that differentiated it from other disciplines. How is it a science? What are its theoretical concepts or constructs? Only when we know what differentiates it from other disciplines, we are able to know what its theoretical constructs are. So first of all, we discuss Viktor Shklovsky. We discuss his essay, Art is Technique, in which he introduces the concept of defamiliarization. This is a very famous concept, and this concept led to the concept of estrangement and the concept of, and the theory of foregrounding in linguistics. Shklovsky says that our perceptions become habitual with the passage of time. When we see an object time and again, when we see an object in the morning, in the evening, when we see it every day, our perception of the object becomes habitual. It becomes automated. By the word automated is meant that we lose sense of the object, the object, the perception of the object becomes unconscious for us. It is similar to our practice of driving. When we drive, we do not pay attention to each and every part of the vehicle. We just automatically drive and sometimes we are not even aware of how our hands move, how our legs move how we apply our leg to the brake, how our hands move to press the button of the horn, because it is an unconscious and automatic process. How has it become unconscious? Through practice. We have done it again and again. We have mastered it. So the perception of it has become habitual and automatic. Because of the automatedness, because of the habitual status of the object, the object has lost, lost newness for us. It no longer appeals to us. Even the fear of war may become habitual and automatic. So something that becomes habitual, something that loses newness, is something that is boring and that is cruel. Shklovsky says that there is only one remedy and that is art. Because art removes objects in the world from its automated and habitual state. It renews reality. How does, how does defamiliarization occur? How is the object or the world renewed? Shklovsky explains it by taking an example from the works of Tolstoy. The name of the short story is Shame. There is a horse in that short story. So the first te technique of defamiliarization is not naming the object. The world is looked at from the perspective of the horse. So an unusual perspective is another technique of defamiliarization. When you look at the world from an unusual perspective, such as that of a horse, and when you don't name the object you are describing, this is defamiliarization. The horse looks at the world, how people have appropriated the world in terms of private property, how private property is meaningless for the horse, how the horse doesn't know the names of things. How names are just categories imposed on things. This whole new perception of the world is realized through this technique of defamiliarization, says Shklovsky. So what is the task of this technique of defamiliarization? What should the poet do? What should the artist do? 
the artist says Shlowowski has to make the stone stony. What does it mean? How to make the stone stony? It means that the object has lost its real nature, is lost in the unconscious perceptions. The job of the artist is to reveal the originality of the object. And when the originality of the object is revealed in its continuity, reality is renewed. But this is a slow process, says Shklovsky. The task of the artist who uses this technique of defamiliarization is to slow down perception, is to increase the length of perception. Perception has become so fast. We look at things, things have lost meaning for us. And life has, has become fast. The artist who uses this technique of defamiliarization slows down our perception. We see the world in a slow motion. And when the length of our perception is increased, we see the object in its original form. So we see the stones stony. This was the concept of defamiliarization. Another theorist of formalism was Boris Eichenbaum. Boris Eichenbaum was also part of this society for the study of poetic language. His essay, The Theory of the Formal Method, is of much importance when it comes to the basic tenets of formalism. We are going to analyze this essay in the context of formalism. Boris Eichenbaum begins his essay by saying that the, that the endeavor should be, that, that the artistic endeavor should be marked or characterized by this effort to make literature a separate domain of science. That there should be this effort to uh, separate literature from history, from philosophy, from psychology, and from other disciplines to give it a scientific status. Uh, he narrates how literature has been looked at from the perspective of other disciplines and how literature hasn't been looked at in, in, in formalistic terms. He says that there is a need of looking at art from a formalistic point of view because the formalistic point of view is the only point of view that can give literature a scientific status. For Eichenbaum, the redefinition of form is important. He, re he redefines what form is. For Eichenbaum, form is not just a vessel. Form is not just an envelope. Traditionally, form was looked at as if it was a vessel into which content in the form of liquid was poured. Eichenbaum says that it was a flawed view. Form is not an envelope. Form is not a vessel. Form itself is meaning. Form itself is complete. Um, Form does not require anything else for its completion. Form dictates its own meaning. Form completes itself by developing into a whole work through effort. Form is autonomous and independent. The, the Eichenbaum discusses how literary language and poetic language has got independence how the sounds of a poem, how the, the uh, syntactic structure of a poem, how the phonological system of a poem uh, stands apart from everything else. I just discussed the practical aspect of things in the context of Immanuel Kant. Immanuel Kant was of the view that the 
Aesthetic judgment is detached from the practical aspect of things, from the utility of things, from the usefulness of things. Eichenbaum quotes um, Eichenbaum quotes Jakabinsky, who wrote an essay on the sounds of poetic language. In this essay, he explained how the sounds of poetry were independent and autonomous, and how the sounds, the words, the syntactic structure, and other features in 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 ordinary language were uh, were uh, not independent and autonomous. We may give an example. For example, if I say the wind is blowing, it is ordinary language and the purpose of this is to communicate a meaning. My message is that the wind is blowing. So the sounds here, the phonological system in this sentence, the syntactic system in this sentence, is not independent, is not autonomous. It is employed towards an end, and the end is to communicate. How is it different in poetry? When Shelley says, O wild west wind, thou breath of autumn's being, here you see the sounds have an independent well value. The sounds have an autonomous value. Here the purpose is not to communicate any message about the wind. Here the message is complete, the sounds are complete, are not dependent on any purpose external to it. They are self-contained. So Jakabinsky in his essay maintains this point. That the language of poetry is different from ordinary language in, in terms of autonomy and independence. Boris Eichenbaum stresses the importance of plot and story by referring to Shklovsky. Shklovsky had made a difference between plot and story, saying that plot was a compositional device and story was a material used for, um, for used for the development of plot. So importance was given to plot. Importance was given to the compositional device over the material. The material existed only for motivation. The purpose of a novel was to focus the focus of a novelist should be on the compositional device that is plot and in this context he explains how form is significant how form is important and how form rules over content how forms adopts different materials for its own purpose but is not dependent on any material how form is autonomous The last formalist thinker was Roman Jakobson. Jakobson was a linguist and uh, his work is of seminal importance in the context of linguistics as well as literary theory. Jakobson developed a model of the functions of language and on the basis of that model he defined literature or poetry. According to Jakobson, there is the speaker and there is the interlocutor. And between the interlocutor and the speaker are the message, the context, the, um, the, and the code. So the context is anything that can be verbalized. The context is the situation that can be verbalized. The code is the, uh, the, the code is what is shared between the speaker and the interlocutor. And um, the message is obvious. When the focus is on the speaker, is the, it is the emotive function that language performs. When the focus is on the context, it is the referential function that language performs. When the focus is on the interlocutor, it is the conative function that language performs. 
Jacobson adds a few more functions. For example, he says that there could be um, the magic function of language. Magic function means that when the interlocutor is not present, for example, when demons are involved or when prayers or supplications are made to God, so it is the um, magic function of language. Uh, language could serve uh, a phatic function according to Roman Jacobson. Phatic function means that uh, we begin our conversation with certain sentences and phrases or we prolong our conversation with certain sentences or phrases. For example, this sentence, hi, can you hear me? It's an example of phatic function of language. The last function is poetic function. What is meant by poetic fun function? How this po poetic function defines literature? When the focus is on the message itself, it is the poetic function that language performs. It doesn't mean that all other functions are passive. Other functions may be employed, other functions of language may be working, for example, in a piece of poetry, it does not mean that only poetic function is active. Other functions of language are also active. But the emphasis is not on other functions. The emphasis is on the message itself. The emphasis is not on the interlocutor. The emphasis is not on the speaker. The emphasis is not on the context. The emphasis is not on the channel. The emphasis is not on on um, the absent interlocutor. The, the emphasis is on the message itself. And this is poetic function. In poetry, the message is zoomed in. All other functions are of secondary importance. This is his view of poetry, is his view of literature. This is how he defines literary. Anything, any verbal art in which the message is emphasized, any verbal art in which the focus is on the message, is literature. Jacobson um, talks of metonymy and metaphor also. Metaphor for Jacobson is based on similarity and uh, substitution. And metonymy for him is based on uh, contiguity, mm. vicinity. Poetry, he says, is based on metaphor and prose is based on metonymy. These are not easy concepts, especially when it comes to Lacan and psychoanalysis. The significance of this distinction between metonymy and uh, metaphor is important. So far we have explained the basic concepts of formalism with reference to Emmanuel Kant, Viktor Shklovsky, uh, Boris uh, Eichenbaum and Roman Jakobson.